This part of the workshop was a presentation by Jono Niger. Jono has a company called Regenerative Design Group that does very creative things with uh, primarily people's backyards, including miniature forests and other um, interrelational plantings that bring predator uh, insects in and pollinator insects in. You'll find Jono's presentation very interesting. Hey there, welcome back. So I'm John O'Neiger uh, with Regenerative Design Group in Greenfield, Massachusetts. And so um, I work with a lot of different landowners and uh, different kinds of scales from uh, urban farm kinds of projects to uh, suburban homesteads and uh, all food systems and uh, water systems, I'm going out to broad scale farm planning, uh, soil improvement practices. Um, so in addition to Regenerative Design Group now, I'm also uh, working on a project just up the river a few miles uh, in Sunderland with a, a chestnut agroforestry project. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to talk much about that, but I do have, a, of course, a chestnut picture. So um, this is, uh, as uh, was talked about earlier, uh, uh, the Lake Warner Mill River watershed. It's a very diverse watershed. Um, and the question I have for you all is, where do you live in this watershed? And is it up high in the, in the uplands? Is it down low in the floodplain? Uh, is it in the very urbanized areas? Suburban zones where there's houses? yards, small lots, or in some of the agricultural zones with larger properties, different kinds of management practices, and what are some of the practices that are happening there that could be improved or changed that would make a difference in the, in the water quality uh, problems that are being faced here. Uh, so we're going to just jump through a whole bunch of different topics, uh, kind of centrally around permaculture, but also just broadly on um, land care in a little bit more of the um, suburban or homeowner uh, scale, because uh, I think that's the focus for tonight. Uh, so the framework that I often use is permaculture. Have, has some of you all heard of permaculture? Yeah. A little bit. So there's a lot of different definitions. Uh, the one that I often fall back on is a, is a more simple, uh, straightforward, uh, definition is it's a design system. Uh, it's about ecological living, about how we live uh, on the land, uh, and integrating all the different aspects of our lives, plants, animals, buildings, people, communities, all of it. How does it all come together? And there's a focus generally on creating production, creating a, a, a taking care of the needs that we have uh, but also to create beautiful uh, environments uh, and also to steward and care for uh, the land and all of the um, beings that are here. And so we have the permaculture flower, which really is, gives a sense of its whole system's design, thinking about the built environment, tools, technology, culture, health and well-being, finance and economics, land tenure, land stewardship. All these pieces have to come together to work uh, together. So I'm going to go is it, uh, yeah. uh, So uh, what we're doing, some more big ideas, big picture ideas is, again, as I said, we're really provide, taking, how do we take care of ourselves within our communities, providing yields. We, we need to feed ourselves and clothe ourselves and have our buildings, homes, uh, uh, but we're also thinking about providing for wildlife and pollinators, uh, thinking about cycling of waste and nutrients. Uh, as Masood said, the um, cycling of nutrients um, so it stays on the land instead of going into waterways. Uh, water, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a bit, uh, is a, um, really some of the principles there are slowing the water going off the land, uh, spreading it out instead of it being focused and concentrated where it's causing erosion, uh, getting it spread out and sinking it down into the ground, infiltrating it uh, so that it can filter through the soil. Okay, and, 
And so all of this is really um, mimicking nature. It's about thinking about how does nature do things and how can what we do be more like what nature does. Because really in nature there is no pollution. There's, um, everything gets consumed and cycled back in. Uh, and that's really what we want to be doing. So uh, the idea of providing a yield uh, is how do we in integrate all of these different things, food, fuel, fiber, fodder, pharmaceuticals, fertilizer, and fun. And we're trying to create that productive landscape. So here's an idea, just the range of different ways to incorporate uh, food and production uh, um, and taking care of our needs. Uh, edible landscaping, just having, having what we're going to use right around our homes and bringing that production right into our home space. Uh, vegetable gardens and greenhouses, uh, orchards, uh, agroforestry, when you get out into the larger landscape, agroforestry is a system of integrating tree <coughs> crops with either livestock or other kinds of crops, so intercropping. Uh, it's, it's, a, um, it's a way of thinking about perennial agriculture uh, systems that um, provide a lot of these different benefits uh, both to the soil by having perennial crops there instead of using tillage uh, but, and then also having multiple crops happening at once. Um, so uh, forest gardening, which we'll talk on, uh, touch on in a little bit, is a system of mimicking a uh, forest uh, in our gardens and using the principles of mimicking nature um, and trying to make our um, food producing spaces uh, super productive with less effort and less waste. Uh, aquaculture, aquaponic systems, uh, incorporating water uh, and production in a water system. So lots of different ways it can incorporate um, um, yields. So this is a, um, an example of a intensive greenhouse. It's a project that we've been working at in Conway for many years, 10 years now, uh, Wildside Gardens. Uh, and here on the property, an eight-acre property, is a um, earth-burned greenhouse. Uh, so you can see the front um, facing south and the back. Here's the back with a green roof just getting established. Uh, and so small-scale intensive system uh, meant to really help balance out the, um, the um, Cold winter and buffer the buffer the winter weather and provide that season extension in the early in the season right about now and then later into fall as well. So I mentioned the edible forest garden. This is a really interesting strategy for um, lots of different settings, from a small backyard going up to multiple acres. Uh, the idea of um, how could our gardens be a, more like a forest? The way a forest has lots of different layers from ground covers and shrubs and small trees, uh, vines going up. Uh, it has openings and gaps and uh, there's uh, water um, is infiltrated into the ground. There's uh, no erosion uh, in a forest generally. Uh, there's just a lot of cycling of nutrients provides all those things with very few inputs. So there's a whole exploration of how can we create these kinds of gardens. And so here is, this is at Wildside Gardens again. Here it is about 10 years on an east-facing slope. Uh, here's that looking up into that slope. And what we're creating here is a kind of mid-succession forest setting. So there's a lot of light available. There's lots of gaps. Uh, there's fruit trees, uh, there's fruiting shrubs, there's um, some taller trees off to the north and getting um, smaller as you go down. It looks kind of like an old field, like an abandoned field, right? This is not your domesticated, uh, very well manicured site. This is a robust, diverse growing system uh, that we're just steering uh, generally, not, not in total control. So it's kind of fun, kind of interesting, and there's a lot of um, different applications of edible forest gardens. And so here's a, an example of putting together a forest garden is in what we call guilds or groupings of plants. So generally, uh, or often it's around a, 
a tree such as a fruit tree, the pear tree here, and then thinking about what are the other layers that could be incorporated. So this is sort of a simplified pear, fruit tree layer, and a ground cover layer with some of these um, ground covers providing uh, the functions of um, food, improving soil, reducing weeds, um, and, you're, and you're getting harvest from them, such as the mint. Uh, sea kale is a perennial vegetable from coastal areas of northern Europe, uh, super um, uh, easy to grow, perennial. Uh, you can eat the leaves, but you can also, which is pretty interesting, you can eat the broccolis. So right about now, well, they're just coming out right now, but in the next few weeks, as those flowers start to come out, uh, you can cut those off um, and eat them um, basically as a broccoli, but it's a perennial crop that comes back year after year. So we're reducing the need to do the, the, um, all the work for those of you who grow broccoli of sowing the seeds, growing the starts, putting them out in the field, taking care of them, harvesting the broccoli. Here's a perennial crop that functions the same way. And then if you let some of the flowers go, they actually act as an insectary plant and uh, support a lot of pollinators. So uh, similarly, it's sort of an example of a very mixed ground cover uh, with different edible greens uh, mixed in as part of a guild um, grouping. All right, so the forest garden, lots of abundance. Um, here's an example of some of the harvest. Uh, this is in my place up in uh, Leverett, not too far from here. So uh, red currants, um, gummies, and, and some different kind of shrub cherries, nanking cherry, uh, nitrogen fixers, Asian pears. Uh, so lots of potential harvest uh, that can come out of these kind of systems. Okay, and uh, tree crops, as we get into the broader scale and uh, with more space, uh, this is uh, some pictures of chestnut. These are blight resistant Chinese chestnuts and Chinese chestnut hybrids. Uh, super productive, more as an agricultural crop, uh, not so much a reforestation restoration of the American chestnut into the woods, which I think is really important work. But this is really a crop that's suitable for uh, rocky, stony hillsides, uh, um, can, is super tolerant of um, drier, poor soil conditions, and can be integrated into, as I was talking about, agroforestry systems, uh, either uh, ranging livestock underneath, uh, or doing alley cropping, where if the trees are spread far enough apart, uh, you can grow crops in between, so um, there's lots of possibilities. Um, so there's an initiative right now to develop um, tr uh, chestnuts as a viable industry in the um, Western Mass and in the Valley here. So if you know of people who are might be inclined or open to planting chestnut trees, we're looking for people who want to grow them on their land. It's a long-term proposition. We're talking these trees will grow for many, many decades um, be producing a hundred years or more. Okay, so, but in the, zoom back down into the home, the home zone, the suburban home zone, and I have to thrash on lawns a little bit, because um, this is really a, a problem uh, in the amount of lawns that we have, and there's a lot of, there's some statistics about um, lawns in the U.S., 40 million acres, uh, the size of New York State roughly, you know, lots of gas that get used, gets used to maintain these lawns, lots of pesticides, uh, uh, a lot of pollution coming off of lawnmowers, uh, a lot of water use going to landscaping. It's just a lot of energy use. Um, I think we could do better, I guess. You know, I think the point is that there's a lot of other things we can do uh, with our time, our energy, um, not to say that we don't need spaces to um, play on. Yeah, let's go ahead. Um, that we don't need zones to play on, you know, um, run around on, sit in the sun. That I'm not a purist to say that we don't, shouldn't have any lawns. Is that, you know, maybe one option is a smaller amount of lawn space. And that we think about diversifying our landscapes and having a lot of other things happening, meadows, uh, ground covers. This is you know, hay-scented fern, though some of you might um, not dislike hay-scented fern. Once it gets going, it's pretty aggressive. But you know what? That creates a low-maintenance landscape. If you want low-maintenance, you actually need plants that are fairly aggressive. 
uh, that can hold their own. Uh, they can be really beautiful. This is sort of more of like a, um, a, a garden, but a little bit more on the edge of a meadow, so it's not such a printed preen garden. It's more of a, um, a wilder uh, meadow type space. Um, and I think that offers a lot of opportunity for um, letting some of these spaces become more diverse, um, even moving towards that, what I was showing, the pictures of the forest gardens, the edible forest gardens. So, um, so there's more that we can be doing, uh, including incorporating wildlife habitat into the landscapes. Um, it's super important. Uh, this is my property uh, up in Leverett, and um, it may just look like an unkept forest edge to you where I got lazy and stopped managing it, um, and that you'd be right. Um, but no, actually, it's a, uh, um, this is, oh, there's a lot of habitat happening here. This is a maple tree that we um, cut out partly because it was uh, shading a uh, side of our house and we wanted to open up our southern exposure. So instead of cutting it down right to the ground, we cut it off, that's about 18 feet there. Uh, it's starting to, uh, this is about five years now, and so the bark is starting to peel off. The um, woodpeckers are coming in. There's going to start creating cavities in there. It's got a whole other life that's going to happen after it dies. This is an amazing thing. Standing dead trees or snags are a really important part of the ecosystem of our, our environment. And we have a thing in our culture about getting rid of these things, cleaning it up. And, and there are dozens of bird species that require cavities to nest in. And a lot of those birds are declining because of lack of habitat right now, lack of cavity nesting. And you need to have trees that are uh, 18, 20 inches or larger uh, to get in order to get some of these cavities going. And so um, we can actually create those in the landscapes that we live in. You know, maybe not right next to our house or next to a path that we walk on a lot. You know, there's safety considerations. but. Uh, in addition, um, that brushy edge and also that's a rock pile, it's a little hard to tell, it's a pop, stones, those are all great elements for habitat um, on the landscape and it's important to have a lot of that there. Um, also, um, room for pollinators, it's getting a lot of attention now, it's really exciting uh, that we're realizing that um, pollinators are important. In order to have pollinators, you have to have some of these unkept edges, you have to have some of these meadow spaces uh, and, and having a lot of diversity. Our strategy is to really um, have some planted zones where we're putting some things in, and then we have a lot of zones where there's uh, um, plants are coming and going as they want. Uh, Anis hyssop is one of those where uh, you can get it going and then it'll begin to just kind of seed around. Um, great for tea, but it's also an amazing pollinator support planted um, flowers for a long, long time. Anybody recognize this flower here? Ice cap hydrangea. <laughs> no, not ice cap hydrangea. No, it's a mountain mint. Oh. Pycnanthemum uh, species. It's a, it's a really exceptional uh, mint relative that grows a little bit higher, three to four feet high. And uh, we've been planting it around, and it supports just this astounding diversity of insects on it. It's just amazing. I uh, don't know the name of this wasp there, um, but it has a really iridescent shine to it. And there's a spider hiding out in the yarrow. Um, so lots of diversity, lots of life there. Uh, okay, so um, the, you know, one of the facets of um, permaculture and this kind of edible landscaping, sustainable landscaping, ecological landscaping is um, bringing the gardens close to where we live, is having gardens around our homes, um, partly just because it's easier, it's easier to care for them. Uh, this is, again, up at uh, Wildside Gardens at Conway, and so the home is surrounded by gardens, um, gardens for pollinators, uh, gardens for fruit and herbs, um, all within easy reach of the home. And then, um, as, the, as you get further and further away, there's larger landscape um, and, and connection to the um, natural area. So this is a wet meadow uh, and there's a, a boardwalk that cuts through there. Oh, go back one, let's see. All right, so coming back to some water management. 
uh, aspects as I was mentioning, thinking about some of the principles, which is to slow the water down off the land, uh, get it spread out, and, and get it sunk into the, into the ground. And, the, and really what we're aiming for, one of the important principles is the water should be leaving the land that we're on cleaner than when it arrived, filtering it. Um, that's part of that is moving it through the soil, uh, um, keeping, keeping, it, um, keeping it held as much as possible. And so this is an example of the water collection and distribution system that we worked on uh, at Katie Will Community in Coleraine, which actually now has a new name, uh, which I'm not remembering. Um, and so it's a multifaceted system where we're trying to collect and hold the water along the way as many times as possible. So in this case, the uh, water comes off of the roofs and instead of putting gutters on, uh, they gave us the challenge of how can we pick up that water along the base, um, which is what we did. We picked it um, up um, on the ground and then brought it into a tank. So that's about a 550 gallon water tank. So we're trying to create storages, as many storages as possible, as high up on the land to be able to use that um, with gravity, ideally, um, to feed down. And then the overflow from the tank goes into a pond, collects and holds there, creates a, a, a beautiful space, a, a, a microclimate, and um, provides some habitat, some opportunities to grow some different kinds of um, aquatic plants, um, edibles and non-edibles. Uh, the overflow from the pond goes down through a swale system. And what this is, is basically uh, trenches, shallow trenches on contour across the slope. And those are meant to slow the water and allow it to go down into the ground instead of uh, rushing down, uh, picking up sediment and headed towards a water body. It's meant to infiltrate it. So these systems of swales are, are a final effort on a fairly steep slope to get that water down into the ground. And uh, we've found them to be very, very effective. Uh, in especially in places where you have good drainage, uh, in some of these hill areas uh, around the edges of the valley, um, and it's a um, it's a great strategy in certain conditions. Okay, another one on another water tank system. The other tank I showed was 550 gallons. This is a little bit smaller. It's 350 gallons. It's still quite a bit bigger uh, than you would have to have. What is that? Six or seven barrels, 55 gallon barrels, to match a tank like this. And so this is a tank that um, it's a little hard to pick, see the scale. It's um, about six feet tall and about four feet uh, in diameter. Uh, so it's it's large, but it's it it holds a substantial quantity of water, which is needed if you're going to use rainwater uh, for irrigation. The, the 55 gallon tanks are good. It's a good start, but it's not a lot of volume if you're really going to substantially use it to get through a drought and, uh, and provide water to your garden. So we generally try and scale up the volume of water that we're collecting. Um, this is a gravity feed system, so it just comes out uh, and it's designed so that it goes right down into an orchard uh, and uh, kind of a developing forest garden zone down below. Okay, so still thinking about water and but bridging into a, kind of an urban zone in Northampton. Here's a project that we worked on uh, where uh, my friend and colleague Paige Bridgens, small urban lot. This is the north side and this is her driveway. Uh, she had um, uh, not enough space to do all the gardens that she wanted to put in. And she said, well, why should I use all, have all this space on my property covered with asphalt and for parking? And it's also just pushing water off into the storm drain system. So one way we can deal with this, we can actually start to pull up some of the over pavement that we have in our communities and around our homes even, is try to unpave. And it's actually not that hard. Uh, here I am cutting the asphalt between hers and her neighbors because the neighbor didn't want to remove their driveway. Uh, 
taking up the, uh, the asphalt, digging the sand out, putting it up on free cycle and having um, people who need some sand to come and take it away, filling that up with um, soil and compost and uh, um, um, rock dust to remineralize the soil, um, and, and voila, a year later is a beautiful garden space growing lots of plants. So this was her driveway a year ago. and um, This is what we can do in our community, some places where we just don't have enough. And so not only is it creating more beauty, more food, but it's also slowing down water that's moving off the land uh, where we have put too much pavement down, too, covered over too much of the ground, uh, which is causing huge issues for stormwater uh, management. All right, so yeah, let's just scroll ahead and get all those out. So I just put down a whole list of all these different things, just I knew you'd be needing something to, to uh, perk you up at the end of the evening here, or later on in the evening. So these are just a lot of different strategies. So, um, you know, we're, as I talked about, trying to mimic ecosystems. How can we use less inputs, less lawn, less labor, less cleanliness? Let it be more diverse, using lots of perennials using mulches and connections. So it's a lot about repairing damaged sites. That's a lot of what's happening right now. Is, um, we pretty much any land you see around has, uh, is, is degraded and denuded in some fashion or another. That's just centuries of use. That's what we've got. Um, so we need to be doing a lot of restoration, uh, um, harvesting and recycling resources, catching and holding water, as I talked about. Here's one that's really important to me. Um, we have a habit of burning biomass in our properties. It's just something that I don't know, people like to do or think they need to do. It's, a, it's an idea of it's that cleanliness thing. Um, really, we don't need to be putting that carbon up into the atmosphere. Really, that carbon is so valuable, that organic matter that's so important. And that organic matter breaks down really fast in, in our humid summers. Uh, and we can have brush piles, we can have brush piles off to the side, you can chop them up smaller if you need them to break down sooner. Um, but I really recommend not burning biomass and looking for ways to incorporate it into the land um, and, and utilizing it on the land. Um, really, really important. Um, and important for building soil, right? Biomass, that biomass that we can produce here in this environment in this temperate zone that likes to grow trees and lots of stuff, we can use that to build soil. Uh, planting trees and perennials, um, some, some principles about relative location and design, and putting all the pieces together so it works really well, um, using appropriate technologies like electric mowers or other, other um, um, systems that use less energy, right? So, Look for ways to bring in some new approaches and, uh, and connect to your neighbors. How's our time doing? Uh, we should be wrapping up soon with yours. <laughs> okay. I'm thinking that um, this, this is uh, more like we could talk about some of these things. I think we should just skip through. I added soil building more to, um, all right, and then that's the last one. So I brought up a lot of different things, covered a lot of ground. Any questions? I saw a term just flashed by there, verma, verma, verma composting. Compost. What's that? That's composting with worms. Ah. Yeah. Yep, with red wigglers, generally compost worms or barnyard worms. It's a certain type of worm that gets used in uh, worm bins. It makes incredible compost and, it, and it's filled with uh, the microorganisms that are important for re-inoculating the soil and getting that whole soil food web going. Thank you. All right. Hey. Thank you.